This is the seventh in a series of lectures on differential geometry. In the last lecture, we imagined uh, we had a single vector field or manifold, and we thought about its flow. In this lecture, we're going to think about how two or more vector fields interact with one another. First, let's remember what uh, properties of flows of vector fields have. Um, we have a flow of a vector field, so if we have a vector field x on a manifold, then it has a flow, which is a map phi, and it takes some open subset of r cross m to m, and we write it as phi t of point m uh, to mean phi of tm. And it has the various properties, one of them being that if you don't flow at all, at any time at all, you just stay where you are. Another being that if you um, were to ask how quickly you flow through a given point, that would be given by the value of the vector field at that point. And um, another that uh, phi tm is defined uh, for fixed m, if you pick any particular point m, as defined on a maximal uh, interval. It's defined on an interval, it's not just a sub an open set in the row lumber line, but actually an interval, a maximal, I should say open interval maybe, um, uh, and uh, for, for which this is, for which these properties are possible. And um, also that we said that if you float uh, for some amount of time, and then you float for some other amount of time from some point, that would be the same as if you flowed for the sum of the two times through the same point. Um, and uh, again, it's defined on the largest um, open set for which all these properties are, are, are somehow achievable. Um, so let's see if we can find a simple example. Um, let's think about on uh, our manifold being Euclidean space. Uh, suppose we take this guy, an n by n matrix, a real entry matrix, um, then uh, we can look at um, a so-called linear vector field. Uh, linear vector field means um, a vector field x so that at each point, little x in Euclidean space, it gives us exactly the value a little x. So we take well, the point where we're standing and we linearly transform and get a velocity for how, for how to move from that point. So that's what's called a linear vector field. Now, we can ask, how do we calculate the flow um, of this linear, of the linear vector field? This is such a simple example. It should be possible to find out what the flow is. And, and it turns out that it's given by the following formula. Um, it's the exponential of the flow at this time through this point, little x, that's supposed to be little x, um, is exactly the exponential of ta times little x, where what's the exponential mean? Uh, the exponential of a matrix is defined um, as for any square matrix by the usual Taylor series expansion for the exponential function, but we just plug a square matrix into it. So the sum of the a to the k on k uh, factorial, a to the k on k factorial, k is 0 to infinity. We interpret a to the 0 to mean the identity matrix. Um, so all we've done really is to take the exponential function and plug a square matrix in to its Taylor series. And that gives us a notion of an exponential of a matrix, which uh, hopefully you've seen before, but if you haven't, that's fine. And I'll leave it as a problem for you to check that that is the flow. Um, uh, so it requires, of course, that you check there is an exponential. This is convergent and smooth, and then you figure out why it is that you can differentiate it and get that this uh, turns out to be the flow. This motivating example is so important that we use it as a, as a source of a notation. Um, so uh, it seems that flows uh, of, of very simple vector fields are given by exponentials. And so on that basis, uh, we'll always write the flow of any vector field um, for any vector field, not necessarily a linear vector field, but any vector field on any manifold, we'll always write the flow not, with, not as phi tx, but using this more, um, more uh, sort of uh, suggestive notation, e to the t capital X, little x, as an exponential of a vector field. We have to be very careful. There's a danger here uh, in thinking about this. Uh, this notation is very dangerous. It gives the impression that this uh, expression means some kind of exponential expansion like that. 
In the case of a linear vector field like this in Euclidean space, when you write down a matrix and by a matrix and you create this vector field, it is true that the flow is exactly given by an exponential function. But for a general vector field on a manifold, this, uh, the actual flow, if you really compute it, isn't actually given by an exponential at all. We'll use this formal notation as if it were an exponential. That's just a notation, though. It doesn't really mean there's actually an exponential function at all. And there are simple examples in the lecture notes that show you how to compute flows in some, some nonlinear uh, cases, some cases that are more, more complicated than a linear f uh, vector field. And, uh, and, and that show that the exponential function doesn't even show up at all in the, in the, in the calculation of the flow. So the flows don't necessarily uh, flows don't uh, involve uh, uh, exponential functions uh, often. Uh, so it's not unusual that, that if you actually computed out the, the flow, it wouldn't be given by some kind of simple exponential expansion of this expression. You wouldn't sort of formally write down an exponential of a vector field in coordinates. That doesn't happen. What actually happens is the flow is given by some horribly messy, complicated phenomenon, some complicated formulas, but uh, exponential formulas, exponential functions may not appear in those formulas. So it's a danger because you might think that this expression is, is telling us how to compute the, the flow. It's not. It's just a notation. It, this is a notation for the flow. And it's a notation we'll use because it's a very common one. There's another less dangerous aspect of that notation, um, which is more of an exercise for you to check, that in fact the notation gives the impression that e to the tx, the flow of a vector field through a point or in a manifold we might write e to the t x m if I have a point and we like our points sometimes to be called little m because they're in a big n manifold um, that, that uh, the, the notation already suggests that somehow that all that matters is the product t times x because it's written in terms of t times x so I leave you to check that that's actually true that that aspect of the notation is not misleading um, it is true that the flow really only depends on the product of t times x. It doesn't depend on the t and the x individually. So this is actually helpful, uh, a, part, a helpful part of the notation. Now we want to think about how it, uh, two vector fields interact. That's the point of this, of this particular uh, lecture. We're really not thinking about a single vector field, but about two of them. Let's start off with remembering our notation x, f, where x is a vector field and a manifold and f is a function, um, and that's the rate at which uh, f increases along the flow of x. Um, so in our current notation, we could write that as the derivative at t equals 0 f uh, composed with e to the t x. That's the, uh, the flow. And uh, we differentiate the flow uh, with regard to time t, t flow time t, uh, but we differentiate an f uh, along that flow. Okay, so that's the xf, what, what it means, how fast does f go, change as we flow along x. Now, um, what, we can, what we can do is it's an exercise for you to check that uh, if x and y are vector fields on the same manifold, smooth vector fields, then um, consider uh, the operation that takes a function and calculates out y on the function. In other words, how fast does f change along the flow of y? But that's a function, so we can then ask how fast does that change along the flow of x? So we can compose these operations of, of differentiating along y and then along x. And then um, we can take the difference um, by ask what, asking what happens if we do it in the other order. Um, if we ask how fast does f change along x and then along y? And if you want to check this, well, to, what, you, what you can do is you can expand this out and you can find that there is a unique vector field um, that, that computes out this quantity. This is Zf for some uh, unique uh, smooth vector field, Z. So there is actually a vector field that computes out the difference between uh, what's, what it's like to flow first along x, then y, then y along x. This does seem like a difference of second derivatives, uh, so of partial derivatives, right? If we think of differentiating along x as like taking partial derivative in the x direction and this in the y direction, we know that ordinary partial derivatives that partial derivatives in, in, in several variable calculus commute. So we sort of would expect this to be is equal to zero, but it turns out it's not quite zero. And we can cal cal calculate simple examples to check. How do we do this? Um, if you expand this out, I leave you to check it to, to check the result. You get uh, an expression which which we can which we can write down very explicitly in a chart. Um, so 
uh, this thing is always written, um, this z is always written as the bracket of x with y. The bracket of x with y is the vector field so that it computes out this guy, so that when you ask how fast is f uh, change along the rate of z, it's exactly the difference between these two. And that's, that's when z is the bracket. Okay. So what is this bracket? How do we compute it? And again, it's an exercise for you to check that the bracket of x with y um, should uh, be given by the following, in, let's say in a chart, it's always given by xi in the chart, uh, dyj dxi minus yi of x dx, capital X, uh, j dxi, um, and all of that multiplied by d uh, d x j. Have we got no? We haven't quite got that on there. Okay. Um, so uh, so that's the bracket. The expression for the bracket. It's uh, basically looks like the coefficients of x, the derivatives of y, the coefficients of y, the derivatives of x. So it looks like we're differentiating the vector field y in the direction of x, differentiating the vector field x in the direction of y, taking the difference, which is not too surprising because that's after all what you'd expect from this kind of expression here. You'd expect to somehow differentiate y along x and x along y and take the difference. Um, so that's something for you to check. It's not hard to check. You can just expand this out and see what you get. Um, remembering that we have, after all, an expression for what xf is, that it's actually just xi df dx xi, sorry, of x df dxi. So for two vector fields, x and y, capital X, capital Y, we can calculate their bracket like this, and it represents something about uh, how it, different it is to go along y and x, or x and y. Okay, um, So that's the um, expression for computing out the Lie bracket it's called the Lie bracket of the two vector fields. There's a, a long but unpleasant uh, identity called the Jacobi identity, which I'll leave you to check, which is this one, that the bracket of x with the bracket of y with z, for any three vector fields, x, y, z, um, if you write them as cyclically, so I change the order by moving the z over here and sliding the x and y forward, so um, put them in the should be the same order, x, y, z, x, y, z, x, y, z, but cyclically. So we push each of them forward, and the last one goes to the front. We push each of them forward, and the last one goes to the front. So the last one's the y, it goes to the front, and then the other two go forward, z, x, and then bracket, bracket, and that should be zero. It's called the Jacobi identity. Um, and I don't want to check it because it's unpleasantly long, um, but you can check it as a nice example of expanding everything out in this kind of these kinds of expressions. Let's try and explore this Lie bracket and see what it means more geometrically. We have an explicit expression for it. We have this explicit expression right here for how to compute it out in terms of the entries of x and y in any chart. But that doesn't tell us what it means. Um, if we could get some kind of geometric understanding, um, we might try and do that along these lines. Um, suppose we take so we take vector fields x, y. Uh, vector fields, and then we take f, uh, a function, a, a scalar function, and then uh, we're going to try to calculate out uh, the following expression, second derivative in s and t uh, at s, uh, sorry, s equals t equals zero of what? f composed with e to the s x composed with e to the t y minus the other way round, e to the t y e to the s x. So we flow along y for a while, for time t, then we flow along x for time s, and then we calculate the value of f. And then we do it the other way around, in the opposite order, first along x for time s, then along t, uh, along y for time t. So we do it the, the two different directions, and we compute, compare, uh, compute, compute the difference. We compare the two possibilities, and we calculate this out. And what we're going to calculate out is that this turns out to be minus the Lie bracket. Uh, evaluate it on f. Okay, so let's see why that's true. Um, so that gives us at least some intuitive sense that the Lie bracket is measuring uh, the difference between trying to flow along one in one order and then trying to flow in the other order. The the tendency of the the uh, these things to not commute with each other. These flows. Um, so let's um, let's uh, see why that's true. Um, sure, first of all, we have that x f is um, the rate. Uh, at which 
um, f uh, changes along the flow of x. And so, um, not surprisingly, then if you try to calculate y x f, you get the rate uh, at which this guy changes along the rate at which this guy changes along. Um, and we can actually plug the, the flows in together. It should really be this guy uh, composed with the flow of uh, y, but you can put it inside the uh, derivative and um, get this guy here. Okay, so uh, so I'll leave you to convince yourself that that's right, that we're allowed to do that, because this uh, should be, in some sense, be computed first, this derivative, and then this thing, but you can pull it inside the derivative and get that. So I'll leave you to convince yourself that that's true. And then uh, the other, sorry, um, what am I doing? X, I want x, y, f is the other way around. Um, uh, ds s equals zero dt t equals zero f composed e t y composed e s x um, so if you take the difference of the two this minus this um, you get exactly the uh, the negative of the Lie bracket um, and so we've proven this result here okay so that's the um, very easy proof of um, of this commutator identity um, now we get a slightly stronger result which is if you just um, so we've only got the this thing computed for for this derivative for s and t right we've got a second derivative in st um, what about all the other derivatives of this expression well we won't get all of them but we'll get some of them um, what we can say is that uh, f composed e to the sx composed e to the ty minus the other way around uh, is in fact uh, minus st bracket x, y, f plus cubic terms in s and t, which are too horrible to compute out, but uh, we only need to know that they're cubic or higher order uh, and, and plus higher order, right? So the next terms are cubic. So if this quadratic term, and there's no other, no, there's no uh, constant term, no linear term, no other quadratic terms, and then it goes on to higher order terms. And the reason for that is that um, this expression here, if I plug in, if you just take that and plug in uh, t equals zero, then you get a big zero, all the, this, this is equal to that, right? If I plug in t equals zero, this drops out, this drops out, and I just get t equals zero, I just get exactly the same thing, f compose sx minus f compose sx. And similarly, if I plug in s equals zero, it all becomes just zero. And so there can be no, um, this implies there are no uh, pure t terms because all the t derivatives of all orders will have to be zero. If I plug in, uh, sorry, no, to plug in t equals zero, you get s, there's no s terms. And then when you plug in s equals zero and you'll get everything zero, there are no t terms. No pure, pure s terms and no pure t terms. So all the terms that occur in this series expansion have to have both an s and a t in them, at least one s and at least one t. So the only way you can do that at, at order uh, 0, 1, 2 is to have this term. Um, and then so all the other terms have to be higher order. Okay, so that's the um, argument that says that we get uh, the, this quadratic term and then everything else is higher order. So now finally we want to think about um, trying to understand the, um, the, uh, the relationship of the bracket to the commuting of the flows. What we want to say is that the, the vector fields commute just when their flows commute. We'll say that vector fields commute um, I said to commute uh, if um, their bracket is zero, and the theorem is simply that um, x, y uh, commute um, if and only if uh, their flows commute. By which, of course, I mean that uh, this uh, flows taken in one in one order are the same as taken in the other order for all s and t and for, that's for all for s and t for which this makes sense of course there's the problem that as we've said before somehow the flow of some vector field might flow off the manifold we might have some manifold which consists of just an interval and the 
flow of the vector field flows right off the edge. So there is a danger that flows don't, aren't always defined for all time. So we have to be a bit careful. What this says really is that this is uh, true when it's defined. Uh, when one side's defined, the other's defined, and they're equal. Um, so that's the, the, what this bracket is helping us with. It's telling that if the, bra it tells us the bracket is zero, that's how we can detect the flow is actually commuting, which is surprising because it's easy to check the bracket, and it's um, almost impossible in almost every case to calculate out what the flows are. So, um, so to prove, um, one direction is easy, that if the flows, um, if, if the flows commute, then what we discovered is that f uh, of e to the sx e to the ty must therefore be equal to f e to the ty e to the sx, um, that because the flows are the same. Um, but that implies, therefore, by differentiating the brackets are zero, because we express the bracket in terms of the difference of these two. Now let's go the other way and suppose that um, that uh, the brackets um, uh, a bracket is zero, and we want to show the flows commute. Now what we found is that um, that f uh, e to the sx e to the ty minus f e to the ty e to the sx um, is cubic uh, in s and t for small s and t. Okay, now, um, and, and the bounds on the, these cubic expressions are going to be uniform as long as we work in compact sets. Um, so we're going to do this very much locally. Um, so let's do a local uh, uh, part of the story first, and then we'll worry about how to get it to work globally. So because we're working only locally, we can assume that our manifold is contained in Euclidean space as an open set. Um, and we'll only work in for small times s and t. Um, so we'll just do this a uh, uh, very local picture of this, and then we'll try and patch it together and get something more global. Now we can take this little f to be any smooth function, uh, so it could be any uh, smooth function. In particular, we can let it be uh, f b x one or f b x two, and so on. And so, since we're working in Euclidean space, um, those are smooth functions. And so we can, uh, therefore, in particular, uh, say that this tells us, since it's true for any smooth functions, including the coordinate functions, that in fact these flows, when you write them out in, uh, in Euclidean space, uh, you can actually calculate the location of a point in Euclidean space by, the cal like by its, these coordinates. And so we can say that, in fact, these things are um, uh, cubic. This difference is cubic in s and t. Okay, so it uh, starts out with, with a cubic term. Okay, so now what we want to do is to make use of that uh, cubic term. We're going to simply take um, take n some large uh, positive integer, which will of course soon go to infinity, um, and let's let epsilon be 1 over n. Um, then we can flow uh, for very small times. We can take the flow of uh, of time uh, time s and split it up into many many little flows. Um, it becomes uh, epsilon s x epsilon s x dot 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 epsilon s x. In other words, it's n times e to the epsilon s x to the n. Okay, so we can split up a, a time s flow into smaller times one over n times s each uh, n times over. Now, when we want to flow not uh, just along x, but also then along y, we can calculate that out by um, by saying that we take e to the sx, e to the ty, flow first along y, then along x, as um, lots of tiny little flows along x, and then lots of tiny little flows along y. Okay, so lots of little flows along x, lots of little flows along y. There are, of course, supposed to be n of these in all, and n of these in all. And again, epsilon was by definition just 1 over n. Okay, so that's uh, splitting it up into tiny pieces. Now, suppose I take these two little tiny pieces and I switch the order in which we write them. So we'll write the same thing. Um, 
but now there are only n minus 1 of them. And then I'm going to swap the order of the last one of these x's and the first one of these y's. I'm going to swap those two. So now I get that y, that y flow swaps with this x flow. So here's that y flow. And then this x flow, the last of the x's and the first of the y's swaps order. And then the rest of the y's are still here. Um, and now there are n minus 1 of them. But you can't really write these in the opposite order. They don't commute. Um, but we do know that this, that this uh, is, is a proportional to some cubic. So the error in swapping the order of these two terms to become these two terms um, is cubic. So it's an error that's cubic in, um, in the s and the t, and in this case, cubic and then in epsilon. So cubic in epsilon. So it's a cubic error. Okay. Now, what happens if I do it again? I now swap this y with the next one, and so on and so forth, and I swap it all the way over. What if I keep swapping? I swap, 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 swap. So what if I swap all the x's over all the y's? Um, so there, how many are there? Well, how many swaps are there in total? So uh, the total number of swaps that you need to get all these little uh, e to the epsilon s x's over all of those y's, uh, total um, n times n plus 1 over 2, which is approximately uh, an order n squared swaps. And I get equals um, all the uh, y's, uh, little y flows, have swapped over all the x flows. So I've got all the y's here, and then I've got all of the, uh, sorry, e, s, epsilon, s, x, dot, 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 e to the epsilon, s, x. All the x's have swapped over all the y's, plus there's approximately n squared swaps times epsilon each cubic. Uh, in epsilon each. So this was cubic in epsilon, this is quadratic in n. Um, so, uh, so I've swapped all the x's over all the y's. Um, the total number of swaps is this, which is about order n squared. And then each swap gives me a cubic error, uh, approximately epsilon cubed error. And so, um, well, order of that, let's say. Um, but we know that we said epsilon was by definition 1 over n. And so this resulting error is... Uh, well, putting this all together, that's e to the ty, and that's e to the sx, plus an error, which is um, approximately uh, order epsilon, um, or if you like, order 1 over n. So what we find is e to the sx, e to the ty, minus e to the ty, e to the sx, is something like order of 1 over n, or order of epsilon. Now, I get to move n to be anything I like, so I can send n to infinity, and this side goes to 0. But here, there's no n at all. There is no n. Um, the, the expressions epsilon and capital N don't appear here at all. So when you take this limit, this goes to 0. This stays fixed as whatever it was. And so, therefore, this thing therefore is equal to 0. Okay, and that's the proof. Well, that's not quite the proof, because in order to get that to go, we had to work in local coordinates. So this only really proves the results true in local coordinates, and only for small enough s's and t's so that we stay inside the coordinate region. So there are some issues here about how you patch that together, but they're very minor, because once it works for small s's and t's, it doesn't, it's not just working for infinitesimally small, but for some actual size of s's and t's in some compact set, um, then I can move around uh, the uh, e to the ty's over the e to the sx's, they commute for small enough s's and t's, and then I just keep going using another um, s and t and another s and t and so on. Uh, because it's some finite size of s's and t's for which this works near each point, um, I can keep going, 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 and swapping over and over until I get all the, uh, all the flows along all the y's to swap along all the flows along all the x's. So, um, so there, of course, if for larger s's and t's that go outside a chart, you have to put together an argument that involves patching up, going, staying inside one chart, getting as much uh, of the y's over the x's as you can, as commuting as much as you can, and then going to the next chart, and so on and so forth. So it's not very interesting, and I won't go further than that. That, for us, will be enough of a proof. We can then plug in uh, values for s and t, uh, replacing them by values of uh, letting them be equal and, and then taking them to be not, not t but square root t, we can easily check the following, which is a similar uh, kind of expression, 
but only involving first derivatives, um, that the, the derivative at t equals 0 of f composed e to the minus root ty composed e to the minus root tx composed e to the root ty composed e to the root tx is in fact the bracket. This is maybe a more convenient expression, partly because it only involves one derivative, but also um, it, it manages, and it only involves one variable t. It doesn't have the s and the t. But it, it gives you a sense of what we're, what we're doing with the Lie bracket. What we're doing is moving a little bit of x, then a little bit of y, backwards the x, backwards in the y. Um, and, uh, and we're making that little bit very, very small, and we're seeing what that does. And that gives you a sense of what is the Lie bracket vector field. It's the vector field that, that somehow um, goes switching back and forth rapidly between doing some x, doing some y, back with the x, back with the y. Um, and so in a picture, we could say we sort of go along x, along y, backwards along x, and backwards along y. And we don't necessarily end up back where we started. We end up um, with some sort of gap. And then as we make this just to the right proportion, it has to be square root t to make it work. It's just a bit annoying. But other than that, basically, if we make that, we, we find that the, this, this gap here is, uh, is approximately the Lie bracket. Um, so it gives us an intuitive sense of what the Lie bracket means. Let's give a, a kind of geometric picture of, of this whole story. Um, imagine that we're um, skating on ice. So we've got an ice skate um, which has a blade under it. Um, and we can describe the ice skate uh, uh, geometrically in terms of, say, some center of mass or above the, where it touches the, the ice, and, uh, and then also a direction. So it has some, some center of mass at some point, x, y. Um, center of mass of the skate. So imagine that's where the skate is. And then it has a direction uh, that the toes are pointing in, theta. Now, um, when you're standing at that point, x, y, and that, and that pointing in that direction, you can't, uh, you can't turn around um, the, the blade. Um, it's it's stuck on the ice and that pointing in that direction. So the only thing you can do is move forward. Um, you can move according to your velocity. Can be some multiple of the x direction of your the direction of the of on which the skate's pointing, and y dot can be some same multiple of sine theta. You can only move uh, in the direction that the skate is pointing, but you can move backwards or forwards, and you can move quickly or slowly. Um, so how do you move? You move by pushing with your back foot. You use your back foot uh, and the blade uh, uh, horizontally with the, against the direction. And you, you push, so you can push yourself uh, back with the back foot to, to, to make the skate go forward. Um, and you can, in principle, go backward as well. So, uh, but how do you then cha ever change direction? It must be possible to make some sort of theta dot. Well, there are there there is of course the possibility that you lean. You lean to to the left or to the right, and as you lean to the left or right, your angle actually changes on the, along the ice. Uh, so you get some control over the angle. And so what you get to control is the u and the w. Those are your controls that you can that you can manipulate to change how you move along the ice. So, um, so we want to say then that, that there's a manifold here, um, which is some manifold, which is the plane with coordinates x and y, uh, crossed with the circle, which will have a coordinate, an angle coordinate theta. Um, and uh, so the circle, of course, being uh, r mod, let's say, 2 pi z, so uh, uh, as a manifold. And, um, and on that, we have, on that manifold m, we have vector fields. Um, which are given by, um, well, in terms of x, y, and theta, um, they're given by, um, well, this one is something like the u cos theta uh, d uh, x. I'll write, I sometimes write uh, d dx just as uh, dx um, uh, to make it easier to write. So, um, so cos theta dx plus sine theta dy. Now, I chose it to be, I chose the u here. The, the coefficient, the speed at which we're moving forward to be 1, just for simplicity. And this will enable us to move forward uh, in the x and y plane according to the direction theta. Note that there's no theta component, so that means we're not leaning over. This is what happens if you go, if you have your back straight up and you're not leaning. You're not leaning. If you're not leaning over, then you just go straight like this. But we could also make a leaning uh, vector field a vector field which looks, which looks exactly the same, except that um, we imagine that we're uh, 
allowed to lean over a little bit. And when we lean, we get some coefficient of change in theta, which I'll just set to be 1 for simplicity. Uh, but it could have been in some coefficient w here that would say how much we lean over by. So uh, x represents, uh, represents uh, skating forward on the ice with your back straight up. So your, your head is straight up. You're not leaning over to left or right. Y represents uh, uh, the, the, the what you get when you lean over and one to one side. Um, so um, so that will that'll alter your theta. So if you lean over to your left, the theta will increase. And so we get to, to, to have any multiple of x plus any multiple of y are our, uh, our, our controls, right? We're allowed to control by having some multiple uh, of x plus some multiple of y as the vector fields we're allowed to generate. Um, and we then can move according to those vector fields. Now the bracket of those vector fields is, uh, is what we're interested in understanding more geometrically. And I'll let you calculate out what it is x, y, minus y, x, you get that it's sine theta dx minus cos theta dy. What does it mean geometrically? Uh, first of all, we want to point out that, that in fact, x, y, and the bracket are linearly independent vector fields. If you look at their x and y and theta components, uh, you can see that they're actually linearly independent because these two are uh, unit vector fields pointing in different directions um, in, the, in the plane. And this guy is different because it has a, a theta component, which the others don't have. So they're linearly independent, three linearly independent vector fields in a three-dimensional manifold. So we fill up every tangent space with these things. OK, now geometrically, what does this thing do? It doesn't have a theta component, so that the angle doesn't stays the same. But, uh, but it's, the, it's the perpendicular direction to x. So when x says that when you're at a point with your skate pointing this way, the capital X vector field just slides you along this way. It moves the skate uh, by sliding it forward in its own direction. The bracket XY vector field does something very different. It moves it this way uh, so that it maintains the same picture, the, the same direction, because it has no theta component. But it actually slides it in the perpendicular direction because it's exactly the perpendicular vector to X. So uh, so the X vector field represents moving along, pushing with your back foot and making the, making the skate go forward. This represents something you can't physically do with skates on. You can't actually make the skate scrape across the ice uh, in, in, the, in the direction perpendicular to, to where it's pointing. But what you can do, very simply, is you can think about our, our description of the Lie bracket as being uh, given by taking a limit of root t x, uh, root t y, minus root t x, and then minus root t y. We said that if you float along for some amount of x and some amount of y, then, mi then minus x minus y, you could effectively cr produce the Lie bracket as the limit of this, uh, or the, and the derivative as t goes to 0. And in, in the case of an ice skate, what that means is that you slide forward a bit. So you start with the ice skate here, then you slide forward a bit with the x flow. And then you slide forward with the y flow, which leans you over. Uh, if I've got enough room. Um, it should lean you over, so you start to curve, and so you end up with your skate moving over here. As you as you curve your direction, your theta goes up, and so you end up with this ice skate pointing like this. Then you uh, reverse the axis, which uh, slides you right back, and then you reverse the y's, so you lean back again, and your end of skate ends up something like over here. So, uh, well, maybe over here. Um, so, it, uh, so the idea is more or less that you've ended up going this way. Now, if I've got it right, um, uh, yeah. So I'm leaning. Uh, so I should have said that the point, the yeah, the, the I did the picture the wrong way, I think. And the, the 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 bracket vector field, according to this, if I've got it right, should be the vector that does this. So you can see how you do this on a skate. You go sliding forward, then you lean and and to the left and turn this way. Then you slide back, then you straighten up your back and go straight, and then you lean. And so you end up with, um, with yourself ending up back where, back where you started, but slid over a bit. So you can see geometrically that this is, in fact, the geometric pi the picture uh, of the ice skate, how the ice skate behaves is exactly what we expect for the Lie bracket. Well, up to <laughs> maybe I've got the direction wrong, but more or less you can see the idea that it gives you the right, the right picture.
Um, this is very similar to a parallel parking maneuver, and so that's a, a nice exercise to think about how parallel parking works uh, in, in this context. And there are similar problems um, for other more complicated control systems like linked together skateboards or um, a, a tractor with a wagon and that sort of stuff that you can calculate out using Lee brackets. So I think that gives us an intuitive sense of what the Lee bracket means. It also gives us a serious example where vector fields don't commute. Bracket of x, y is not zero here. It couldn't be zero. We actually I calculated out what it was, but it couldn't be zero because they just don't. The flows don't commute. Um, so uh, what we want to think about then is what happens if they do commute? Can we make a nice theorem? Uh, can we generalize the flow box theorem? So here's the simultaneous. flow box theorem. Uh, suppose we have a collection of vector fields, so x1, xp uh, are linearly independent at every point and uh, commuting. Their brackets are all zero. Bracket of any one with any other one is zero. Um, uh, then uh, there exists a coordinates, or in other words, there's a chart, um, say x1, to xn on our manifold on which these vector fields are defined. Without saying it, I'm assuming they're all defined in the same manifold. Um, there are coordinates in which they actually are x1 is uh, d dx1 dot 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 all the way out to xp is d dxp. Note I used n here. There is an n-dimensional manifold. There are only p of the vector fields. p might be equal to n, but it might be smaller. might only have two vector fields in a million-dimensional manifold. That's fine. That would say that we can make, e make both of them be these simple vector fields. So these are the simplest possible vector fields, and their flows are completely clearly understood. So this is very much like the flow box theorem, where we'd have only one such vector field. And linear dependent for just one vector field just mean non-zero. So this gives right, right back the, the flow box theorem we had before. In fact, the proof is identical to the flow box theorem. What we're going to do is we're going to take um, some uh, any coordinates, uh, pretty much. Uh, so we take some coordinates. Let's call them x1 to xp, y1 to yq. Sometimes we allow our coordinates to have different letters. So far, we've always called them x1 to xn, but here we're going to let them be uh, something that we called with x labels and others with y labels. But this is one all put together one chart on our manifold. Um, uh, so, of course, p plus q is the dimension of the manifold. And uh, and we assume that x1, we pick them so that x1 to xp have um, uh, linearly dependent uh, components. If we write them out in, um, in just the x1 to xp uh, variables in the, just the x variable parts of them are already linearly independent and we can always do that by permuting variables as needed to make that happen. Now we're going to try and, and make a, 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 a map which is exactly the same map we made when we did the flow box theorem. It's just simply let um, phi of and now if we call them s's before I don't know why I'm calling them t's now it doesn't really make any difference. Um, y1 a bunch of uh, t's and a bunch of y's, so instead of x's they become t's now, and just let them be flows uh, time t1 uh, vector x1 dot 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 uh, time tp vector field xp, and then uh, applied to the point zero, uh, well maybe I should say zero zero zero, this is uh, in uh, rp p zeros, um, and then y1 to yq. So that's p zeros there, and then y1 to yq. So we apply this to this point, and um, and we can calculate out what the derivative of this thing is, um, just like we did for the uh, for the um, the flow box uh, theorem. Uh, the derivative in t1 is x1, um, and uh, at well, let's say at um, what do I want to say at at t equals zero at t equals y equals 0. So at the origin is simply x of 0 at the origin dot 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 uh, d phi dt p is xp at the origin at the origin. Um, and then uh, the other derivatives uh, at the origin y1 at setting all the t and y variables to 0 um, the origin of those, those coordinates uh, is well it's just uh, e, um, uh, what do I have? I want to say it's, um, uh, well, d, 
D Y uh, one and so on and so forth. Um, D phi D Y Q at the origin of the T and Y variables is D D Y Q. Okay, so that calculates out the derivative map. Um, so you can see that it's a diffeomorphism because these are linear dependent. Um, so um, so phi is a diffeomorphism at least near enough to the origin after we maybe restrict to some smaller open set around the origin by the inverse function theorem. Um, so then, uh, then uh, just as we did before, it makes a change of variables. But what it does is, of course, it makes um, it makes the um, the vector fields um, even when we're not at the origin. Uh, this guy. Um, or if you like, the push forward of uh, this vector field is exactly um, x1 at phi of t and y. Um, because we go back to this expression for what phi was, when you differentiate the, this vector field, um, you're, doing, you're differentiating its flow. And so its derivative of its flow, the rate at which its flow changes is, is how fast it's going, it's its velocity, x1. And so that gives you this guy. But um, so that that only works for x one. The uh, for the other x's, you'd have to somehow do some kind of uh, differentiation, um, you know, through through the various exponentials. But um, but because we can reorder the the, the vector fields, so uh, the x uh, i's all commute. Uh, so we can reorder. Uh, uh, we can reorder. So any one of them can be x one instead of doing. Let's say we can change one to two to three to whatever, and so we get that phi star of d dt of any of the dt's is the x at phi of ty. And so that says that phi pushes forward all the vector fields d d t i to become the x i's. And so it's a change of variables that will take uh, these coordinate vector fields into these uh, vector fields x i. And that's exactly what we said existed. We said there's some chart, which would be phi inverse, would be our chart that will take the x i's to these rather boring vector fields. What we found is a diffeomorphism taking the boring vector fields to the x i's. So the final topic for this lecture is is, is um, something that I'll leave more or less to, to, uh, to exercises. Um, uh, this is the notion of, of, of uh, related vector fields or, or uh, correspondences of vector fields. So if I have a map uh, of manifolds, smooth map of manifolds, and I have a vector field uh, on P and a different vector field on Q, then it's often useful to, to notice that they might be related in some way, and the relationship is not necessarily uh, completely trivial. Um, we'll say they're, uh, they're related or... Uh, uh, they correspond if um, uh, at each point, well, for each point, little p in big P, um, phi prime at little p times the vector field x at that point, it gives the vector field y at the corresponding point, q equals phi of p. So the obvious relationship, we've used this before. We differentiated and said that this is what the, the a vector should correspond to on Q. The vector that on Q that corresponds to this vector on P should be this one. should be given by differentiating the map. And so that's chain rule applied to velocity vector gives velocity vector. And it has, therefore, the trivial consequence, which, again, I leave us an exercise that um, implies that the flows, that if you uh, apply, uh, apply the flow, you flow along a manifold P along vector field X for a while and then decide to map to, uh, to, to, the, to Q that you get exactly the flow for the same time on the, on, on the Q. So it matches up the flows. So this or intertwines the flows. So related vector fields or corresponding vector fields have intertwining flows. And I, I'd, I'd say that's, that's a trivial uh, chain rule calculation. So I'll leave there to check that. Um, and th that's a useful, uh, useful observation. It is interesting, though, that sometimes this is, it's not, not necessarily a trivial relationship. Um, we could just have a simple example, um, phi of s and t, two variables, maps to two variables. So this is a map from the plane to the plane. It's going to eat s and t variables and spit out x and y variables according to just letting x be s and y be 0. And then you make a vector field in the st plane, s ds plus ST, DT, for example. Now, um, that's in the ST plane. 
and this is a map from ST plane to XY plane, but it's not a very uh, very interesting map. It sets Y to be zero. It sets X to be S. So it takes a plane uh, ST and maps it to a plane XY. But what does it do? It sets Y to always be zero, so it really just maps it to that line. Okay, so it's really just projecting onto this line and sticking that line into the plane. Okay, this vector field, capital X, uh, you can easily check corresponds um, uh, corresponds to both uh, to both of the following vector fields, um, y of x y. So this is an x. I should say this is x of s t. ST plane vector field over here, and it corresponds to this vector field on the XY plane. Y is um, uh, X DX, but it also corresponds to the vector field and to uh, Z of X and Y is, um, is X uh, plus Y DX plus Y cubed DY. And that's because uh, when y is 0, well, we're mapping to this line, we're mapping the whole plane here, projecting it to this line where y is 0. When y is 0, that shuts off. And when y is 0, that shuts off. And then these become exactly equal, which you can check turns out to be exactly what, what this vector field maps to. So it's possible to have two different vector fields on this plane uh, that this one vector field corresponds to. So it's a somewhat subtle relationship, uh, the correspondence, but it does match up the flow. So it'll match up the flow of this, this x vector field, both of these flows, but only along the points where it maps to. It only maps to this, uh, to the line when y equals 0. Okay, so uh, I'll leave you to check that. Um, and, and another thing you can check is that, um, in general, if you have corresponding vector fields, suppose x corresponds to some x bar, and y corresponds to some y bar. So these are vector fields on some p, and these are on some q, and they correspond. Then, because the flows match, you can differentiate the flows, and you get that the brackets match uh, or correspond. So the bracket um, will correspond to the bracket. So it's a useful relationship which we'll make use of, and it's, a, it's an easy observation given that the flows match, and you differentiate the flows. Intuitively, there's some similarity between um, between having uh, a group uh, act and having a vector field act in that we had this basic relationship about the flows. Um, we had this basic relationship about flows, which looks like a group law, um, and we write it in our exponential notation as flowing for time t1 along a vector field, and then for time t2 along the same vector field. Um, gives us flowing for time t1 plus t2 along our vector field. You can see the, the, the exponential notation is very satisfying because that looks an awful lot like what you're used to for laws of exponential functions. But it's also very similar to a group law. It's similar to saying that the group of real number addition is being somehow matched up to some group of diffeomorphisms of some manifold. And so we'd like to start thinking about how to make use of vector fields um, to understand group actions more generally. So we're interested in groups acting on manifolds. And in the next lecture, we'll begin to think about how we would uh, make a, a, a decent theory of groups acting on manifolds. Um, so that's, a, that's our next step, is to study Lie groups.